Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning at Harmony Road Baptist Church for our YouTube service this morning. And we hope that wherever you are in your home or if you're listening on a phone via somebody else's computer, that God will reach out and bless you this morning. And we thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to open with a scripture. Um, it was from the devotional that uh, I was reading this morning, and I really found it quite powerful. And it's from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. And it says, Thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is our Father and the source of all mercy and comfort. For he gives us comfort in our trials so that we may in turn be able to give the same sort of strong sympathy to others in their need. And I just thought, you know, as we're going through all the times with COVID and all the stress that the past several months have put on us individually and as families, that God does reach out and he does give us peace and comfort. And because we follow him and as we allow him to fill us and allow that to overflow, we can share that same kind of peace and comfort with others. So I'm going to ask you to join with me this morning. We're going to open up with hymn number 500, and it's called The Longer I Serve Him. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he controls, since I gave my heart to Jesus, the longer I serve him, the sweeter. that that is your testimony this morning. So we're going to change over to, if you're using your hymn book at home, it's uh, song number 499, I Will Serve Thee.
I love thee. That's what we're asked to do. Not for much more, but then just to offer ourselves in service. And this morning, I just want to acknowledge the lordship of our, our Savior. Just with a simple chorus, it's in your hymn book. If you have one at home, it's number 103. He is Lord. And we're going to go right from he is Lord into another chorus that I love. And... Uh, my husband asked me if we could do this one this morning. He is all I need. So we'll start with he is Lord and then go right into he is all I need. Just worship the Lord with me, will you? He is Lord. He
Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. So grateful that in a world of craziness and a world of unknown and a world of uncertainties, that you are all we need. You can meet our need. You come to us every time we ask for you. You come and you meet us where we are. And so, Father, I just praise you and thank you, Lord, this morning that, as I sang earlier, I will serve thee because I love thee. I pray that those that are watching have the same heart and the same mind, that our service for you will be because we love you and because you are, in fact, all we need in this day and age. Father, we pray you would give us strength to serve you, the wisdom to know, to be able to follow your word, and, and Lord, to be able to encourage others in their walk with Jesus as well. And so today I pray, Father, that you would just bless each one watching. I pray, Father, that you would be with Pastor Dave as he breaks the word to us this morning and be with Pastor Rob as he leads in prayer later in the service. And we just praise you and thank you, Lord, for everyone that's watching. I pray a special blessing on each one today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Linda, for leading us in that time of worship. And thank you, Linda, for stepping in. Uh, this week, uh, fairly last minute to, to uh, serve in the music ministry this morning. Uh, good morning, welcome. Great to have you all join us this morning. Uh, albeit online, it's better than not. And so we're thankful that you are with us this morning as we come before God and his word. Uh, let us read, I'm going to be reading out of Luke chapter 9 this morning, a message called Sent Ones. And so if you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, uh, I encourage you to follow along as I read the first 10 verses. That's Luke chapter 9, verses 1 to 10. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed and because some of them were saying that John had been raised from the dead. Others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. He tried to see Jesus. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. And then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed Jesus. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who needed healing. This is God's word for us this morning. Let's give thanks to the Lord for his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for who you are. We thank you, God, for your generosity that flows from your, your being, everything about you. God, that you would bless us with your word, the, the written word, Lord, is wonderful, and we are thankful. That you would bless us with Jesus, the living word, is overwhelming, and God, we are thankful. So Lord, bless our time this morning, we pray, as we look into your word, as we study, as we think about it, Lord, may your spirit just guide us through, and Lord, may you overcome any obstacles in our lives that we have from receiving from you today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning's message is called Sent Ones. And I want you to think for just a few minutes about things that you send. Uh, you know, you can send, uh, a, I mean, the old school way is sending a letter of, uh, through the mail system and it arrives in post boxes. You can do that now through different media sources. You can do that now online. You can actually send money to people with just a few push buttons on your phone. It's pretty amazing. I remember uh, being sent different times to my bedroom when I wasn't behaving well in front of my parents. And go to your room. And so I want you this morning to think about places that you have been sent or places maybe that you have gone. Maybe not been forced to, but maybe places that you've been directed to go. 
I want to also distinguish uh, something between what it means to be a disciple and what it means to be an apostle. An apostle is the word that is used for sent one. And a disciple is the word, we've learned this through the last few weeks, about a disciple is one who is a student or a learner. But an apostle can also just not mean a sent one, it can also mean a messenger. And I want us to understand, to begin this morning, to understand that Jesus Christ, I don't think, made huge distinction between a disciple and a sent one. That, in fact, a messenger is inherent in being a disciple. Uh, when you look through the different encounters that Jesus had with people, in Matthew chapter 28, we've gone over this week after week, and Jesus gave this command to his disciples to go and make disciples. Uh, the disciples are sent by Jesus. In Luke chapter 9 here, we're seeing that they're sent out two by two into the surrounding areas uh, to preach the gospel and to bring healing. In Luke chapter 10, right, the chapter right after the one I read this morning, Jesus appoints 72 more disciples and sends them out. In Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, when Paul recognizes Israel's need for the gospel, Paul says, And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, who bring the gospel, the message of the gospel. Of course, Jesus also says to his disciples uh, in his resurrection appearance after, uh, to the disciples after he was resurrected, he says in John 20, 21, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Paul, again, when he refers about the ministry of reconciliation, about how we are reconciled with God and how we are reconcilers of people to God, he says in verse 19 and 20 of 2 Corinthians 5, so we are messengers for Christ. God is using us to call people, so we are standing here for Christ and begging people, come back to God. Again, when Paul and Silas and, and Timothy is along with them, Timothy was Paul's disciple. And when Paul and Silas and Timothy were out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, uh, the church was admonished by Paul for this wonderful thing. It says, your church welcomed the message despite your suffering. The Lord's message rang out from you everywhere. So we want to remember this morning the distinction that, that an apostle, a sent one, is inherent in being a disciple. In uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 48, when Jesus has this resurrection appearance and he re reveals himself to the disciples, he says, this is what was written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. He says, you are my witnesses of these things. As long as there is a message, there are messengers. As long as there is a gospel message of Jesus' death and resurrection for the repentance of our sins, the forgiveness of our sins and our need for repentance, there is a messenger and there is a need to bring that message. Witnesses in the Bible, a witness is basically someone who sees something amazing or important. And it begins when a person shares what they have seen. And we call this bearing witness, giving witness to something. Back a couple years ago, we had a funny experience as a family about a witness. We were down by the Oshawa uh, Mall. We were shopping pre-COVID. And uh, we were shopping. And when we came out of the shopping mall, we recognized at Stevenson and Highway 2, there was a big, uh, big accident of some kind. And we go to this, and we see this accident, and we're like, okay, uh, maybe we can like, go around it, but we were too late because we were stuck in the traffic. And at the same time, we see this car, which looks awfully familiar to us. It was a car that was very much like Lisa's dad's car. And so as we get closer to the accident, Lisa calls her dad and says, hey, you know, where are you right now? And he says, oh, I got a story to tell you. He says, there's an accident. And we're like, oh no, he's in the accident. And we were freaking out. But then we realized, no, he was a witness to the accident. 
He saw what happened, and he was hanging around in a parking lot nearby because the police said, we want you to stick around to tell your story of what happened here. And it was just so joyous, first of all, that he wasn't in the accident. But secondly, it was absolutely joyous as we saw Lisa's dad in this parking lot. We drove into the parking lot, met with him, and he was, the first thing he said is, I'm a witness. I'm a witness. And he was so proud of being a witness of this big event that had happened in his life. As Jesus' disciples, we should be so proud of being a witness for what we have seen and what we have heard, what we have learned about Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, all for the forgiveness of sins for anyone who will respond. In the Bible, the word witness is used to describe both a person and an action. Someone who has seen something. Someone who talks about what they've seen. And then their lives are changed because of it. And Jesus, the fact that Jesus was put to death for our sins is something that we need to bear witness for. And it's, and it's a learning experience as we continue to learn more and more about Jesus. We, we learn more uh, about his personality. We learn more about how he is personally speaking to us, the gospel. And we are his sent ones. We are his witnesses. We are the ones who bear witness to what Jesus has done, not only in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. So let's explore a little bit more of Luke chapter 9 this morning as we look, first of all, a few things about this being uh, sent ones. First of all, they are sent, the disciples are sent, first of all, by the power and authority of God in verse 1. It's so clear. Jesus called the 12 12 disciples together. He gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Jesus was sent, or the disciples were sent by the power and the authority of Jesus. Years ago, a U.S. Naval Institute uh, recorded this proceedings from a, a two battleship encounter. There was one battleship that was the lead battleship, and there was a second battleship that was on training. They were learning, and they were doing these training routes throughout the ocean, and, and the first battleship was training the second battleship how to handle certain experiences. And one evening in that uh, training process, a few days into this training experience, one evening, uh, the captain of the first battleship uh, was uh, notified by the uh, watch person that there was a light in the distance. So the captain uh, blurts out this message. He says, well, is is the light moving or is it standing still? Is it steady? And the the watch person says, no, the, the, the light is steady, which means it's not traveling you know, in a, in a line away from them, it's actually coming towards them. And so the captain is very afraid. So he tells the signalman, he says, hey, listen, signal to the ship that they need to turn 20 degrees. So the signal is sent to this other ship, turn 20 degrees, of which they get a response back from the, the light saying, we advise you to turn 20 degrees. So the captain, the authority person on this battleship says, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm a captain. He says, you have to turn your ship 20 degrees. In which he got a response from the person saying, well, I'm a, I'm a seaman second class, and you had better change your course 20 degrees. Power, you know, authority challenge here. So the captain at that point was furious. And the message was sent, I'm a battleship, change your course 20 degrees, to which he got the response, I'm a lighthouse, change your course 20 degrees. There was a battle for authority going on in this little illustration, uh, but it's just to highlight the fact that there is authority that takes place, and for the Christian, the authority is Jesus Christ. He is one who gives us power and authority to give witness. He is the one who has called those disciples back then and calls us today to preach the gospel. And I'm not going to go into the whole aspect of the healing ministry that Jesus proclaimed to the disciples too in depth today, but I will say this. Anytime that Jesus did a miracle of healing for somebody, it was to assert his authority over the sickness. He was able to raise people from the dead. He was able to bring people from uh, health and uh, from sickness to health. He was able to bring people from being 
um, kind of like obscured in society and beaten down in society to being elevated in society. But he did all this because he wanted to assert his nature as being authoritative, as having control over everything. So physical healing was to affirm Jesus' authority. And when the disciples went out and they performed physical healings, it was to affirm that God, Jesus Christ, has authority. And isn't it wonderful that God chose such a personal way to reveal his authority? Think about it for a minute. The disciples could have gone out and made mountains move with the power of God. The disciples could have caused a tree to grow out of nothing in the power of God. He could have had the weather change in an instant with the power of God. Those disciples could have done any of that if God wanted that, but he didn't. He wanted healing to people. And there's a beautiful combination of spiritual healing and physical healing that God is so interested in. God doesn't want us to necessarily be healed of all of our diseases. That happens Sometimes God has a desire for us to go through disease. But God has this beautiful message that I am the one who is authoritative over anything. Diseases, anything. God has authority. And God shows his love and care for people. And that he wants to bring healing. The disciples are really ill-prepared for this, when you think about it. They're really ill-prepared for this. They've only been with Jesus for a short while, maybe a year and a half to two years. They've only been with Jesus for a period of time. They have barely scraped the surface from being ones who are cast-offs now to being leaders. And now he gives them this mission to go and preach and teach. They weren't even prepared. Jesus never sat down and told them how to speak to people. There was no course on how you how you evangelize. He just said, go and share from your experience with me. And so you have Matthew, a tax collector, coming from a a beautiful, wealthy background, sharing from his experience. You have a couple of fishermen sharing from their experience. The gospel is for all people, and they would bring the message as sent ones from their own personal flavor, with their own personal way, with the authority of God God in charge of everything. And as these disciples go, and as they go into this world, and they go and they send, uh, as they go as sent ones, and they tell people about Jesus Christ, there's a huge and wonderful impact. And what happens is people start responding. They start responding to what Jesus is, is, is doing through these disciples. And it reminds us of the passage in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It reminds us that we always need to be prepared at any point to give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ. But at the beginning of 1 Peter 3.15, it gives the condition. It says, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. And then what happens? Then we need to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have within us. It's not about going out and and giving an answer without having Christ as the authority of our life. Christ has to be Lord of our hearts. Our lives are in a constant state of changing course. As we encounter the authority and the power of God, God will direct us here, there, everywhere. We don't even recognize all the places that God is directing us, telling us where to go. 20 degrees here, 20 degrees there. And we won't realize that until we meet God again. But our lives are in a constant state of changing. But the one thing that does not change is the power and authority of God if we set him apart as Lord over our hearts. Wherever we go, the power and authority of God will be with us if we set him apart as Lord. The second thing we recognize in this this passage is that the sent ones are following the instructions of Jesus, and they're following the very specific instructions. Jesus didn't just say, go and make disciples, like in Matthew 28. Here, he goes and tells them very specifically in verse 3, take nothing with you. In fact, not only that, he says, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Don't take anything with you. What he was saying 
there is you need to rely on the people that I will place before you to feed you, to house you, to provide clothing for you. You are not to rely on yourself for your own power at all. You are instead to rely on God to provide. Isn't that a wonderful statement? You are to rely upon God to survive. Only Him. He will provide for you. And so there will be places that you find that will say, come on in, let's hear about your message. There will be places that people will say, here, come and eat at our table because you haven't eaten in days. <laughs> here, there's a place for you to come and wash and clean up and we'll wash your clothes for you. And Jesus was saying that they will be provided for. And it's so interesting as well that on the flip side of this, Jesus says, that if anybody does not welcome you, you would have shake the dust off their feet as a testimony against them. This is a powerful, powerful statement that Jesus is saying because the Jewish people, the Israelites knew what the shaking of dust off the feet meant. The shaking of dust off the feet means that, that if you went from, a, if you were a Jewish person and you traveled to a non-Jewish community, a Gentile community, when you came back into your Jewish community, what you would do is you'd brush the dust off your feet so that you wouldn't contaminate the Jewish community. You wouldn't bring any of the sin of the unbelieving area into the believing people of God. But here, Jesus is saying that to the disciples who are going around to Jewish areas. that They're not going to Gentile areas. They're staying at home. And so Jesus is making a powerful statement here. He says, you will experience difficulty. You will experience challenges. Some of God's own people, the Israelites, will not receive this message. And you need to be prepared to treat them as you would anybody who will not believe. It's a powerful statement that Jesus is making to these disciples. On one hand, be fully dependent upon God for everything. On the other hand, you are going to experience great difficulty. G.K. Chesterton, who is a, a poet, an author, a speaker, a, a thinker, um, said this about what Jesus promised the disciples. He said that Jesus promised the disciples three things. One, that they would be complete, completely fearless. And we can see that after uh, the resurrection of Jesus, the disciples went out and were martyrs for him. They, they would be completely fearless, Chesterson said. They also, he also said they would be absurdly happy. And we don't have any record of that in the gospel, how happy the disciples were, but there was a happiness that happened within that community of believers. And he said, finally, they would be in constant trouble. Constant trouble. We know that as we are obedient to Jesus Christ, we will be in constant trouble. As we set ourselves fully upon God, we rely on him completely, we are going to come at odds with so many of the theories and the thinking of our world today. We know that the life that Jesus calls us to is a difficult one because it is smacks dab in the face of all that the world is calling people to be and to do today. We know life has difficulty for those who are sent by Jesus. Just look around our church. Look around some of the difficulty we have experienced as a church. I know that we are uh, well off in some ways. God has blessed and provided for us in many ways. I know that we are, for example, financially, uh, you know, we are well. Uh, God has given wisdom to leaders. There's budgets, people are generous. And financially, we, we are well. There are churches that are closing down, churches that are completely struggling during this pandemic because they don't have the finances and there's so much pressure and there's so much tension. So we know that God has blessed us in that way, but we also need to acknowledge some of the difficulty that this church has faced. We look around at some of the health issues that have been rocking our church. Think about Janet, who um, was supposed to be on leading worship this week and it grieved her heart that she couldn't be because of problems with her eyes. But how she has faithfully proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ in her difficulty. She has been a messenger to us, to me, to us, to anybody who's watching of the goodness of God. Little faith 
I've got to tell you a story, a funny story about faith this week. We were meeting with youth online, uh, with a youth meeting, and at the end of the meeting, we were having a time of prayer. And as we were praying, and we were praying, and, uh, you know, there's that awkward phase that when everybody is kind of, okay, I think we're done, but it's 13.9 seconds or whatever, and it's like, okay, we, somebody's got to pray. And I was closing off the prayer time, and, and so just as we got to that awkwardness, I started to pray, and I closed off the prayer time. And then, over my voice, I hear this little voice lead into this beautiful prayer, and it is faith. <laughs> and because of a technical thing, I guess they weren't hearing me, and they thought that nobody was praying, so faith just belted out this prayer, and I stopped, and we all just listened to it. It was a beautiful prayer, and I was just like, oh, thank you. And, and I was really brought to, to tears that night because I see the beautiful faith of this little girl named Faith. It's just amazing what she's doing in her struggles, in her difficulties. She's being a messenger. She's being a sent one, bringing the goodness of God. I think about it in the life of our own family with Morgan. I think about Bailey and Adam's life this week with the birth of Kylie and the many challenges that this, this little girl is facing even before she took her first breath of air. And yet Bailey and Adam are just proclaiming God and faithfulness. We're so thankful. There are so many others of our church and our people that have experienced difficulty, and we just don't have the time to go over them all this morning. But I want to say, I am so thankful that there are people who are hearing the instruction of God, relying on God, holding on to Him with everything they have, and with the difficulty that they're facing, they're not packing it in, but they're just continue talking about who God is, and they're living it out in their lives. What a powerful witness. They are bearing witness to what they see in Jesus Christ. Finally this morning, witnesses are sent to witness the greatness of God. Witnesses are sent to witness the greatness of God. In verses 7 to 10, and then flip ahead to verse 43, we see the impact of the witness of these disciples. Herod by word of mouth, heard what was happening, and he was confused. He thought this was John the Baptist, but he killed John the Baptist. It can't be John the Baptist. And then he thinks, oh, people are thinking maybe it's Elijah or other prophets that have come back and from the dead. And are, are, No, the impact of this is all through a man named Jesus. And so Herod in verse 9 says, I want to see him. Curiosity of Herod to see who is this person who all these people are speaking about, all these people are doing these amazing things about. All as a witness to the greatness of God. And when the disciples come back in verse 10, they can't help but report to Jesus all that has happened. Oh, we did this. Oh, we did this. Oh, we did this. You see, sent ones are quick to testify to the greatness of God. Sent ones are quick to testify to the greatness of God. But here's the problem. These disciples started to get enter into this place where they, they, even though they returned back and they were excited, and even though they saw all these amazing things happening, they also ran into this problem. And the problem was they faced failure. If you read ahead in Luke chapter 9, you'll see that there's, after the transformation and after Peter's confession of praise, you see that there's this story about a man who comes to Jesus with a, his son, his only son, who has an evil spirit in him. And he comes to Jesus because he believes Jesus can do something about this. And he says, teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him. In verse uh, 39, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions, and he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves and is destroying him. This man is desperate. And then in verse 40, he says a powerful statement. I begged your disciples to drive out the evil spirit, but they could not. Why couldn't they? Didn't they have the power and the authority of God with them? Couldn't they do this? And Jesus responds to the man, O oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? He's tired. Bring your son here. And he performs a great healing. The disciples failed. The disciples failed to portray the greatness of God in this 
event. How can that happen? I think we're given clues here that we see in, in, verse, um, in verse 10 where the disciples uh, turn to Jesus and they say uh, a very subtle thing, but they say they reported to Jesus what they had done. They reported to Jesus what they had done. And then we see another glimpse of it uh, back, moving ahead if we look in verse 46 because right after this healing of this demon-possessed boy, we see that the disciples start to argue, well, Jesus, uh, who's going to be greater? Am I going to be greater than him? Is he going to be greater than him? Is, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And this is even highlighted more so in Matthew chapter 9. If you flip to Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 24, we see that Jesus has the same story here about Jesus and the disciples. But Jesus says, you failed at delivering this boy from evil because this kind can only come out by prayer. Put it all together. What Jesus was saying to the disciples is, you got your eye off me as your authority. What happened is you got your eye off me as the one who you're out doing this for. I am doing, I want you to do this for the greatness of God, not for yourselves. And the moment the disciple says, look what we did. Who is the greatest? And Jesus' response, you need to have prayer, guys. You can't just go out on your own and do your own thing, expect results. You have to have prayer. You have to bathe this in faith in God. And it was a warning. It was a warning to them to not exalt yourself, but instead exalt God. And it comes at the end of that healing that Jesus does with the boy with the evil spirit. As the story continues on, even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in convulsion before Jesus. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit. He healed the boy and gave him back to his father And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. And while everyone was marveling at what Jesus did, he said this to his disciples. Listen carefully what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. Jesus Christ, the greatness of God, drove out this evil spirit, gave the lesson to the boys who were following him for years, and said to them, You need to exalt God. You don't exalt yourself. Because as sent ones, we are to only exalt God. A couple of weeks ago, we started to announce something called uh, Gospel Reports. And we believe strongly, Pastor Rob and I believe strongly in, in this important ministry that we need to be involved in. Gospel Reports is something that really came, I think, from God to us and just said, we need to start hearing reports from our people about how they're handling COVID, how they're handling this pandemic. I mean, it's hard to believe it's been over a year now that we've been in this up and down world of pandemic, wearing masks, not being close, whatever, all the headaches that come with it, all the death that has come with it has been devastating. But we want people not to get their eyes off of God. I mean, when you listen to the news, when you watch the news, all you hear about is pandemic. But in that, as Christians, we can lose our focus on who God is. So we ask people, we send out through emails, and we put out this invitation to continually for you to send in, what have you learned about God through this experience of this pandemic? What have you learned about the nature of God? How has God revealed himself to you? And we've got back a few responses. I'm looking for more. We're looking for a lot more. We'd love to compile up a whole binder full of these responses about how God is revealing himself during this pandemic. But let me just read an excerpt from one of them, and I'm not going to say who this is, but it's powerful. The year began with incredulity that without a shot being fired, the whole world was heavily placed under house arrest. Interesting phrase. To my shame, my first thought, my first thought was not to look up and offer praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, For he has done great things. It was more to wonder who benefits from this. As the lockdown became more stringent, opportunities to praise God came rolling through my door. I saw him at work again and again. The time not spent in traveling to various obligations became opportunities to do the tasks that were waiting for someday when time permits to be done. 
This brought about a finding of a piece of paper which led to doing volunteer work for the Lord through a ministry designed to strengthen the faith of believers. Through a divine appointment, a, a, a word from God, I came across this verse by Verse Ministries. So it's a Verse by Verse Ministries International is the link. And it has teaching materials that are completely free to anyone. And I began listening while doing the mundane tasks to teaching on book after book of the Bible, leading to a continually and continuing deeper and stronger appreciation of how complex and how complete the book is, how the Bible all ties together, how everything is in it for a purpose, how it is all about Jesus from beginning to end. Powerful, powerful statement of what God has been speaking into this person's heart through this pandemic. How God has revealed himself. How the gospel is still there. The message is still there. Learning more and more, getting deeper into the word, deeper into the relationship with Jesus Christ. But it didn't end there for this person. They go on. And then the schools locked down in January. And we had no choice her and her husband, to help our single mom working from home daughter, their daughter who's a single mom working from home, I should say, with the online learning of her daughter and son. We had opportunities to spend time with these precious ones. Two weeks ago, it began again, and we have had some sweet, heart-melting moments, opportunities to show them the love of God. There is so many opportunities out there right now for us as messengers, as sent ones, to go and preach the gospel, to go and bring healing of different kinds to people's lives. It might not all be physical, but there can be healing that can happen as long as God is our power and authority, as long as we rely on him, and as long as we witness to the greatness of who God is. There's opportunities to show people the love of God as people are desperate and looking for hope and meaning and purpose. People are isolated and alone. There's an opportunity to reach out. We have a wonderful gentleman in the church who calls people every day because every day is a new day dedicated to something. And he calls. And we, we get calls here at the church. Hey, Pastor Dave, just want to let you know that today is the day of blah, 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 you know. And Okay, never knew that. Don't know how that's going to change my day, but hey, it's enjoyable to hear from you. Ah, the opportunities are just so abundant out there. We cannot get our eyes focused off of Jesus and the greatness of God. God is far greater than any world sickness. He's far greater. He's greater than that. It was Jesus who said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell won't go against it. This is not the gates of hell. This is just a disease. Mind you, it's a powerful disease. It has affected so many lives. It has killed so many and continues to do so. But God is greater than this. And we need to be focusing as sent ones, as, as disciples, as apostles, as people who have a message from a messenger. We need to go and bring this message to people right now who need to hear about the goodness and the greatness of God. I once had a friend of mine years ago in ministry training who said to me, Dave, he says, when it comes to being a witness for God, you don't really have a choice. Once you become a believer, you are a witness. And the question really is, will you be a good witness or not a good witness for the greatness of God? My prayer this morning is that we will take this opportunity as sent ones who have a message that brings life to people to go and bring life to people that allowed Jesus to, to do whatever he has to do in their hearts to prepare them and to do whatever has to be happening in their lives after. But we need to bring the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to people more now than ever before. People are hungry for something that will provide meaning and hope and love and peace. People are hungry for this right now. We need to bring this to people now as sent ones. It is on us. And the question for us is, will we be good messengers? Will we be good sent ones? Or will we be poor ones? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, God, that you give us your word and that you speak to us in these beautiful 
words to help us understand more of the heart of God. I thank you, God, that someone many years ago in my life took on this challenge to be a witness, to be a messenger. And they came and they reached into my 16-year-old heart and said, hey, I want you to come and, and meet some friends I have at a church. And from that moment, my life changed its course forever. God, thank you for that messenger. Help us to believe today, God, that there are so many people out there waiting, just needing, longing for something from you. And even if they don't know a God, we can point them to you and we can let them know that what they are longing for, what they are needing, what they are in desperate need of is, is God, a relationship with Jesus Christ. God, help us to be messengers of that good news. It's great news. Help us, God, to not bury it in the ground like we heard the parable that Jesus told about how burying it in the ground doesn't accomplish anything for the kingdom. But God, we need to be responsible with what we have been given. And we have been given the words of life from you, God. Help us. Help us to be messengers today. By what we do, by what we say, May we bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into our conversations with people, into our actions with people. May we bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into everything we do and say so that people will notice us, they'll see we live differently, and they'll want to hear the message that we have to bring. Heavenly Father, guide our steps. Help us to place you in authority. Help us to give you the lordship over our hearts. God, we pray that you will teach us from your word as it has authority in our lives. God, that you will speak to us and that you will empower us, God, to reach this broken world for your son's name. And Lord, that we will be so quick and so fast to give you the glory, Lord. That we will not glorify ourselves as if we have any glory, God, but that we will glorify you. You will, God, humble our hearts and keep us from becoming proud. Help us, God, to love like your son loved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother, come on up and share with us. That's great. Thank you, Pastor Dave. What a great message. What a convicting message. And I pray that all of you are listening and asking God yourself, how can I be a messenger? Also, the, uh, the desire we have uh, to hear from you about how God is revealing himself to you through interactions. And so, again, just what Dave has just shared, send it into the church, send it to one of us, and we'd love to just share, like Dave did today, of how God is working in your life during COVID. It's prayer time. And as we go to prayer, there's many things to pray for, as all of you are well aware. Many things in life, many things going on around us, in our families, in our church, in our community, uh, so much. As I, as I begin this prayer time, I want to remind you of one of my favorite hymns. It's definitely a favorite whenever I go to a, a nursing home or to a senior's home, um, and it's a classic, but it's what a friend we have in Jesus. Let me remind you of the first verse. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So let's carry everything to God in prayer today. Today is a special day amongst CBLQ churches, uh, churches Canada-wide from coast to coast. It's a national day of prayer uh, to deal with, to pray for those who are being affected by COVID. So let me just read this today. It's, it's a, a prayer today. So we're going to be praying in unity with all churches across Canada for those directly affected by COVID-19, our healthcare professionals, essential workers, the poor, the marginalized, who often get missed even during COVID, government leaders and policymakers trying to respond and restrictions and province to province. So we need to be praying for Trudeau. We need to be praying for uh, our, prime, our Premier Ford. That God and that God may use our churches to provide support and hope to all of them. Pray for those who are in ICUs and on ventilators to that they would recover. Pray for those who are suffering because of COVID. Pray for those who are grieving because they've lost a loved one because we are losing loved ones during this COVID. So lots to pray for. So it's a Canadian National Prayer Day. 
uh, National Day of Prayer uh, for those being affected by COVID. So let's just keep that at the top of our list, but there's many other things, and I'm just going to go to prayer. Hopefully you have a prayer list in a bulletin somewhere. If you ever need a bulletin, don't hesitate to call the church, and we'll get a bulletin to you, or you can come by and pick one up. So let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for opportunities you give us to pray. And there's nothing that hinders us from praying at any time in our day. Lord, whether it's when we wake up in the morning, whether we go to bed at night, whether it's before a meal or after a meal, a family time together as we pray as a family or praying here as a church. God, we know that you love it when your children pray. You love it when we talk to you, when we listen to you, when we spend time with you. So God, forgive us. Forgive us when we're distracted. Forgive us when we're selfish. Forgive us, Lord, when our, our lives are just twirling around ourselves and not keeping you in the center. But today, Lord, we stop and pause. We reflect and remember that you are sovereign. You are absolutely in control of this broken down world. Lord, you are the answer to every man and woman and child. Lord, that is looking for a a need and, and is struggling in life and don't know where to turn, and you're saying, I am the Lord. I am your God. Turn your life to me. Listen to my voice. God, we thank you for who you are, that you are the great I am, that you are absolutely pro as so sovereign and in control, and, and, and Lord, you are omnipresent, you are omnipotent, and you love us with the greatest love. We thank you for your mercy and your grace to each of us today. We are sinners. Lord, we struggle with issues in our head, in our mind, in our actions. And thank you, Lord, for hearing us when we confess our sins. Thank you, Lord, that we can take all of our stuff and bring it to the cross and lay it at your feet, knowing that your son, Jesus, died on the cross for our sins, that we might be cleansed by the blood of Christ, restored, renewed, reconciled because of what Jesus did, that completed work at the cross. Thank you, God. Thank you for forgiveness. Lord, we pray with churches across the country for those who are being affected by COVID. Every province, every city, every town, Lord, is being affected around the world, not just in Canada. So today we pray for those who are being affected by COVID. We pray for families. We pray for children uh, restricted. Uh, from playgrounds and for doing, for going to school, workplaces, uh, gathering together with families. God, we pray for families and children. We pray for churches. God, that you would continue to help us to be creative in how we communicate. We thank you for technology that allows us to go face-to-face -face through Zoom and, and other or, uh, methods. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you make it possible. But, Lord, we do pray. We pray for those who struggle. For those who, Lord, whose anxieties are high, for those who don't know where to turn, for those who need people, Lord, uh, we just ask that you would send grace and, and love and, and remind people of, of, of your presence and how real you are. So thank you, God. We continue to pray for doctors and healthcare workers and those who are working with those in COVID, and God, that you would, uh, the essential workers, Lord, give them patience, give them strength protect them from COVID as well. And we thank you, Lord, for those responders who were there waiting for us at hospitals, in clinics, doing the testing, uh, giving the vaccines. Lord, just continue to bless them and help them, and may they stay well. So we continue to pray also for our leaders. Lord, we're leaders around the world, some making big decisions about opening up soon. Soon we'll open up, open our cities, open our countries. Oh, Lord, just give all of these policymakers wisdom and understanding and faith that they would turn to you for all their needs. So God, hear our prayers regarding COVID. God, as we look at the list in front of us this morning, there's several things I just want to remember. We want to remember Nicole that hope awaits. And as we pray for her ministry to men, the homeless men and the shelter she provides, she asks us to remember to pray for one of their clients who successfully moved through their program last week and for his continued success. So we pray for this man. We continue to pray for Christine Zeus. She asks us to pray for a family member, Charlotte, who's having surgery on Wednesday to remove a brain tumor. And then there will be chemotherapy after that. So we pray for Charlotte's healing. We pray for Charlotte's assurance of salvation 
in Jesus who she knows. So we pray for Charlotte, and we continue to pray for Christine, her need for a, a new home. Remember Clarence and those who work at the refuge, and we thank you for the outreach they give to youth and, and young people and young families in our community. So God bless the work of the refuge, and we pray specifically with the refuge for their new school, this new property. And they ask us to pray for the property immediately behind the school that they just purchased, that the owners of that property would give them a right of way and access to the back of their building. So we pray for these property assessments and we pray for property rights and, and Lord, that legalities and openness and continue to bless the work of the refuge. We continue to pray for baby Kylie, who was born to Adam and Bailey this past Wednesday. Five pounds, six ounces, a little, a little girl, and Lord, who is a fighter and has been somewhat stable, but born with so many health complications. And Lord, you know little Kylie. And so we continue to pray, Lord, for her lungs. We continue to pray for her body that needs to be healed and needs multiple surgeries, for the pain in her back due to the scoliosis. God, we pray for little Kylie, Lord, that we know that she's in your hands, and your hands are merciful, your, your loving hands. And we know that Kylie is in your hands. So, Lord, just protect this little one. And we continue to pray for Bailey and Adam and their families as they, along with many others, are praying for this little child, that she would be healed and grow stronger every day. So we leave her in your Hands. We pray for Louise and ongoing tests with her heart. We pray for Linda Mack, who asks us to pray for her that she would have peace in her mind. So we continue to lift up Linda Mack to you. We pray, Lord, for uh, those who are dealing with cancer and, and need to be healed. And we pray for their healing. And so we thank you, God, for being with Morgan and we, for Suzanne. And we continue to pray for Janet. And as Dave has mentioned, for her eyesight, which could be cancer related, could also be cataract related, and she can't have surgery for these things. And so we pray for Janet, Lord, who would love to be here to play. And we thank you for Linda to being so available to play so beautifully for us this morning. Thank you, God, for what you are doing. So many things to pray for, God, as we pray for those who are struggling with anxieties and stresses. We pray for marriages. We pray for children. We pray for our families. Lord, there's so many, so many things that we need to be praying for. So God, may we be a prayerful people, remembering every need, uh, remembering for those who've been in COVID and are coming out, remembering those who uh, have family members who are struggling, praying for our, some of our young people, Lord, who need healing and, and direction, uh, for Ruby's family, for faith. God, we, we thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you are sovereign. We thank you that you are... Uh, a God of grace and mercy. So thank you, Lord. Continue to work among us. Find us faithful to do what we can do, Lord. The, the gospel, as Dave has reminded us, it's, we are the sent ones. So Lord, continue to send us out in whatever way we can to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And we will give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as uh, we just consider some of the things in the bulletin this morning, we want to remind you of a couple of things um, uh, VBS, VBS volunteers, still looking for some volunteers for VBS, which is happening in its own way, July 12th to 16th, and you can always contact, email us at harmonyvbs, harmonyvbs at gmail.com if you have any questions. A summer student, we, the government is uh, gracious, and we have money for a summer student, and if you're interested at all, contact the church uh, for that summer student position. I'm reminded this week that the Robert Poole Memorial Scholarship is open and available for those who want to have a, an education in theology. And if you're interested, uh, please contact the church uh, about the Robert uh, Poole Memorial Scholarship Fund. And so there's probably many other things that I'm forgetting, but I'm going to leave you to ask. Call the church. Uh, Margaret is always ready, and so are we to answer your questions. So at this time, I think I'm going to turn it over to Linda. It was a, a great message this morning, and I kind of caught a thread through there when uh, the one scripture that, uh, the one verse where it said that you were to leave with nothing, take nothing with you. 
and just be totally reliant on the Lord to provide for you. And that would be the theme of this closing hymn. This came to me in the middle of the night. I wasn't sure what we were going to close with this morning, but we're going to close it with hymn number 358, and we're going to do verses 1, 3, and 4. And uh, it is, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.'" Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to Thank you, Linda. Thank you for that wonderful reminder. We need to place our trust in Jesus. Anybody who is out there today who has heard anything today from the message or the music or the prayer uh, and, and you are wanting to know how you can place your trust in Jesus, please just take a moment of your day today, bow your head, confess your sins to Jesus, place your trust in Him. If you need help and connection, please call us at the church. We're more than happy to, to chat with you or meet with you on Zoom or whatever to to speak more about what it means to place your trust in Jesus. There's a, a, a wonderful person in the Bible called Philemon. Uh, he has one chapter. It doesn't seem very big, but he obviously was a close friend of Paul's, and Paul calls him his co-worker. And this is the charge that he gave to Philemon. And I guess I kind of want us to all be like Philemon. This is what Paul says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith, in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all the saints. I pray that you will be active in sharing your faith so that you will have full knowledge of every good thing we have in Christ. That is my prayer and hope for you today, that you will grow in your understanding of God through faithful activity, through faithfulness to him, and you will see his goodness in all that you do. Thank you for joining us this morning. And let me close with this prayer and continue to remind your friends and that to join us uh, here online. And uh, we'll notify you of any changes as the government changes things. We'll definitely notify you of those changes. But please join us. Uh, continue to meet with us online as we give thanks to God for who he is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you, God, that you are great. God, that you are powerful. You are mighty to save. 
I thank you, God, that you send us uh, weak vessels, uh, inappropriate in so many ways, God, to be bearers of this good news. But I know, God, you have called us. You, you call us to be your witnesses, to bear witness to who you are and what you have done and what you are doing. So, Heavenly Father, go with us this week, I pray. Give us opportunities to share faith wherever we might be. Maybe a phone call, or maybe an email or a text message. God, give us opportunities to share your goodness, your greatness, and your love for all people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and have a great week. We'll see you again next week.